Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another NovaFlex webinar. So glad you're here. Uh, thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, this is a this is going to be a new ish kind of venture. If you've been along the the webinar adventure with us, um, this uh, is based on feedback from you guys. Uh, we got a lot of feedback from a lot of people saying, "But show us what it's like to do extreme macro with the bellows extension." Uh, we've talked about how to put the pieces together. We've shown what you can do with it, but we're missing this one element. And we wanted to do it in such a way that you feel you're like you're there with the experience. So um, let me get some ground, some uh, housekeeping out of the way first. This is being recorded, so please enjoy it. Uh, you'll be able to watch the replay and bounce around all you like. Be present. Ask questions. If you want to talk to each other, use the chat. There's another place for Q&A. If you have a question you especially want us to consider, put it in the Q&A, and we'll either answer it by chat or we'll bring it on screen and answer it live. Uh, but we want you to get your questions answered, so please ask them. Um, so, so yeah, we got a lot of feedback from everybody. You want to know what it's like to do a an extreme macro bellows presentation, uh, shoot. What's it like to use the bellows? What does it look like through the camera? What adjustments do I have to make? I recorded this for camera setup so that you guys can see, and I would just switch through all of these different things. I did this recording and I edited it to tighten it up so that you get to see me shoot at three different magnifications, uh, you know, kind of wide, closer up and very close using the bellows. And we're gonna talk our way through it and you get to work with me side by side to understand what's going on. Uh, so I did this to make sure that your time is best spent. That's why I'm playing a video instead of doing it live because there's some parts that I just, bloop, 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 I fast forwarded through and that's to honor your time. Uh, so I'm gonna pause it. If you guys have questions, please ask them. I'm gonna pause it if I see a question that makes me wanna pause the video and say, all right, at this point you asked a question, blah, blah, blah. So without any further ado or any other uh, audio glitches, thanks for bearing with me, we're gonna play the video now. Enjoy, and we'll see you in the chat and right afterwards for live Q&A. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you guys a, a look at how I build an exposure for macro, and also how I use the macro bellows. Here you're gonna see that we have uh, a macro lens. This is the Laowa 100 millimeter. We have a NovaFlex auto bellows that has the Nikon Z retro adapter on it. Below the bellows, we have the Castell 2 uh, focusing rail. Um, and that is my, my macro kit today. Uh, below that, we have a Classic Ball 3, and I have my TrioPod Pro 75 uh, outfitted with the short legs so I can work on the tabletop. So having a good base is a great place to start. And then you build up from there. The other things you might see is like I have an external recorder here, uh, an external monitor that's also a recorder. And that's plugged into a larger display over here. Uh, and it's a 27-inch display. So I can either use this 7-inch display or this 27-inch display to do critical focusing adjustments. So that's how I help myself and my old eyes focus. All right, so now we're set up. I have my lens focused at infinity, and I have the bellows on, which adds a certain amount of extension already. So what I've done is I've composed, and I have my camera tethered to my computer, so you can see Lightroom happening over here. Um, so you're going to see these images show up live uh, as I record this. And the other view that you see is that we have... Uh, through the, the recorder, the external monitor. So you can see what it looks like through the camera live in real time. So that's what we have over here on the recorder. Uh, and then we have an overhead view over here that shows the setup that I have. And I spent a little bit of time crafting this. And I'm going to show you how I built it uh, one light at a time. Because I think that that's also important. Uh, but we're also definitely going to talk about what it takes to set this up. So strategically... You can see that I have set this up so that the coin and the camera are almost level with each other. Um, I'm shooting a slight angle down. Uh, I wanted to have that cast shadow forward. I have a, a spotlight over there, and it is casting that shadow forward. And that was, to me, uh, a stylistic choice from the start. 
So I chose to shoot slightly from above uh, so that I could accentuate that shadow and have it come all the way into the corner there. Uh, so I'm tilted slightly downwards. That also means there's less to worry about with the focusing rail. Um, it just moves a little bit at a time. I don't need to worry about locking it down. If I were in a more aggressive angle, I would have to uh, lock it down between shots just to make sure that I nail my focus. Uh, so what I did was I adjusted the focus on the lens first and the bellows draw and then moved the camera back and forth until I saw that I had a composition roughly that, that matched what I wanted. And I made sure that from closest focus to furthest away focus, it didn't breathe too much, meaning that the coin collided with the edge because I don't want that get, to get cut off during the stack. So I have only one light on right now, but I decided to add as many lights as I needed to tell the story. So I'm going to teach you how I, I believe I, I wanted to build this. So the first light that I added was uh, this one up above. I have a, uh, a Pava Tube 26C, which is just an LED tube light that's 10 inches long. And I put it on an arm and I put it out in front and above, sort of Rembrandt lighting for uh, the coin. Now you'll see what happens. You'll see what happens with this is the coin goes from having no definition to having a lot of definition. And this has a, a grid on it also uh, so that it constrains the light and tries to keep it forward. I didn't obliterate the shadow that's in front of it and that was on purpose. In fact, I'll probably back this off just a little bit so I see the shadow definition more. So what this is doing is it's adding some beautiful highlights on the top edges of everything that's in relief on the coin. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do was to add some color to the edge. So I set up the Lido Light 5C, which is just a little pocket LED off to the side. And I played with it like this. So I moved it, I tried behind, which creates this interesting gradient, right? But it does nothing really for the front of the coin, only the edge. And I just bring it forward until it creates a little fire on the side edges. And you see that happens there? I'm going to focus again a little bit. See how that happens? Right on the edge, and if I pull it away, there's nothing. But on the sides, it creates this little rim of fire. And if I'm only forward, I only get that. But if I put it slightly back, I'm going to cheat. And I'm now filling in the shadow with a little bit of red. And if I move it further and back, you'll see that the, the highlight along the edge increases or decreases. So I'm just going to pick a perfect spot where it doesn't blow out. Okay, so I got that. And it's starting to look pretty good. It's starting to look like something that will have a lot of detail when I go in and focus stack. But I wanted another color. I wanted to throw a little blue against that orange. So I set up another light all the way back here. And... I found that I, I started it with it right over the camera. And I'm like, no, I'm going to go off the opposite edge. So now I really have three edges that I'm lighting, three highlight edges separately. And now it's really starting to pop. And I think that that's going to be a wonderful edit to make. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. So, um, so this is where I'm going to start making exposures. Um, so we're at 5.6 right now. And our magnification ratio is mm, less than one to one because this coin is not bigger than the sensor. The sensor is 35 millimeters. So I don't have to worry a lot about, um, about losing light or too much about depth of field, but I still need to crank it down a little bit. Um, so we're going we're gonna to work on that right now. We're just going to stop down a little bit and adjust the exposure. So I'm going to go to F8. Because I know that that's a reliable uh, uh, depth of field right now. And I'm just going to drop my shutter speed until I see, and this is the fun part, and I'm going to bring up my histogram, until I see a histogram that doesn't collide with the left or the right side. Now all of these qualify, right? I just don't want to lose highlights or crush shadows. I think that's too much. So I'm going to leave it right in the middle, and I think that that's totally editable. Um, and I think we're in a good place. And the next thing I'm going to do is just turn off the histogram because I'm not going to change the exposure. 
and I'm going to look at the red dots that you see there. Uh, that's what they're called the focus peaking. So we'll look at that and we see the focus peaking happening. Um, I'm going to find my nearest focus and my furthest focus. So my nearest focus is somewhere around here. Let's see. My nearest focus is somewhere around here. And my furthest focus is somewhere around here. I don't want to get everything behind it in focus, just a little bit beyond. So now I know to start here, and I can look on the scale, and then go over here, and also look on the scale and know that I need to start somewhere around here. And I'm going to make very small increments on this one. So I'm going to lock that down while I get ready. Um, and now we're basically ready to take these pictures, and I'm going to blah, 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 fast forward through this. So I'm going to get, because it's important, I'm going to get the one thing you don't see in the scene yet, which is my intervalometer, which in this case, I don't need the intervalometer part of the intervalometer. I want the ability to trigger an exposure without shaking the camera. So I'm just going to put this on, mount it, turn on both parts of the unit. And I have this taped down because I do a lot of night photography. But when that's blinking, it's ready to go. So I'm just going to turn it off. And every time I press this big button, it's going to take one picture. Take this. It's going to make one picture over there. So that's where we're at. And now we're ready to start. All right. Here we go. And now I'm going to unlock this. And I'm just going to move a little bit closer each time. And I'm going to let it sit and then take the picture so that we don't have any shaking. I'm going to take as many pictures as it takes to see what's happening. And I will occasionally zoom in on Photoshop. I'm in Lightroom over here and see what's happening. So let me go over into Lightroom and we can zoom in and we can see when we finally get down to where we're supposed to be uh, in focus. But right now our focus is still critical and up here, right? So you don't want to go over a hundred. So let's change that to a hundred. There we go. So we know that we're nowhere near where we need to be yet. So we're just going to keep monitoring the other one. There we go. And I'm using my external focus to make sure. But you can see the, the red dots, which is the focus peaking here. And that can help you find your way through this. And you see my plane of focus is definitely not flat. I am not parallel to this coin. And that's causing issues, which I'm solving by having uh, by having this focus stack as we go through. So you really want to aim for about 20% focus overlap. There's easy ways to do math on this, and there's a scale on the focusing rail that can help you be very critical about this. And then there's an attachment to the focusing rail that also allows you to move at a slower pace with even more granularity. And you can tell we're getting down towards the bottom in the focus area now. And you always want to shoot more than you think you need so that you don't miss a critical area of focus. So I'm going to overshoot this on purpose. And I'm just going to keep going. So the next thing that I would do would be to go into Lightroom and process these. And let's take a look at what that's like now. All right. So 
let's imagine that we did our adjustments on this and we wanted to, we we're done making our basic edits. We're going to export. Click export. Oop. And we're going to choose Helicon Focus. And once you do that, you don't need to change anything else. And you click export. And then you wait for Helicon Focus to do its thing. So there's 43 pictures in this. We're going to fast forward through this. Now, I should play some music or something right now, but I'm not going to. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is the part where you export from Lightroom to Helicon Focus. And, and here Helicon we go. Focus over here. Now you see that there's all of these layers in here. We're going to pick the first rendering method, right? And we're going to reset. Now reset this so it's always the same. And hit render. And we'll see what the different rendering methods do. Now this is fast forwarding. If your computer does it this fast, you have a very good camera. Pretty amazing. And this is straight out of camera. No edits. Gorgeous, right? And we look through it and we see that we've got... We nailed it all the way. Oh, might have missed a little bit right there. But it's looking pretty great. Wow. On fire. So I always try all three methods just to see which one will work better. And I'm going to do that for you guys and fast forward through this again. And now we can flip between those and see if there's a, a substantive dis difference that we do or do not like. So some of them might have different experiences with high contrast edges. And that's usually what I see the difference between these is how they handle highlights. Uh, and we'll see how this goes. And since I like them all, I'm going to save them all off. And we're going to just put it right back where they came from. And it's going to prompt us to close Helicon when we're done. And I'm just going to save the other two that I did. I just posted the uh, a link to the different rendering methods explanations by Helicon Focus uh, in the chat. Uh, so feel free to follow that link if you want to know more about it. And we'll save this guy off too. And like it suggested, you should quit out of Helicon when you're done. And then you go back in here and you're going to find that there should be some new one two, three. There's three TIFFs there. So let's take a look at these and see if there's any adjustments we want to make. So there's the C version, there's the B version, there's the A version. With really uh, not much substantive difference between them, right? You can see in the highlights a little bit there. Um, yeah. I think I like all of them and you know I just I might uh, do a little bit of tweaking here you know to just make things look a little more sparkly so we'll bring our highlights down bring our whites up bring our shadows up and bring our blacks down a little bit and then we now, have a little micro obviously going on and look at that look at that you're gonna cook the taste yeah yeah that's looking good. I think we did good with this one. So there's a winner. And now we're going to get even closer. So let's go back to the camera. So we're going to get even closer this time. What are we going to do with closer? Well, I tried something on a different coin that was really successful, which is I wanted to get more of a profile. So let's see what we can do with more of a profile here.
So now we have to adjust our lighting strategy, of course. Look at that. That's pretty. Now we'll take this guy and make him opposite stay. Right? But somehow we got to get him in front of what's going on. So we'll do that by blending. Oh, you might have to come over here. But it's nice to have something that's bigger than, right? So now we're going to increase our our uh, our magnification by going to one to one on this lens. And then we're going to move the whole thing forward until we achieve some sort of focus. All right. Now I've got my focus track backed up halfway just in case. Uh, we may have to move that light, and that's okay. And notice that our exposure is changing. All right. So let's see what we got here. Going to rotate. Cool. Set her down. Let's see what we can do. You got a really crazy beautiful focus stack here. I really want the sun. I'd like to get that sun in there. But every time I get it too close, I'm going to need to move this up a little bit. So we need to find something to place this on that raises it up a little bit. So I'm going to use my card reader. And there we go. If that doesn't work, I have a second card reader. But I think we got it. And we're just going to keep, keep on keeping on until we find that focus. Oh, look at that. Now we've got something. We're cooking. So we have to figure out our lighting next. What's going to help us achieve proper I don't want to do is blow it out. So let's test that. Oh, that's nice. Okay. The one other thing that you can do is back it off. And turn it up All right so we can do that and we can test to see how this works and keep that nice blue increase it more of a teal now. All right. I'm going to come around a little bit. All right, I think we got it. Let's make sure we got a good exposure before we commit to this. There we go. Okay. Let's build it one, one light at a time, kids. All right, let's make sure we understand what all of our lights are doing. So this one is a good highlight. Let's make sure that it's not too high of a highlight, All right? Back that off, make that just a high highlight. Cool. 
How does that look up here? Great. Great. Cool. So let's do this. Let's bring in our highlight. Take off the blue. And make sure that we understand what this guy's doing. And I'm just going to back it off until it's like nothing. So that I understand what it's doing. I hope you guys appreciate that I'm, I'm talking my way through the lighting here, which is always a fun part of this too. This is part technical and part art. Um, and I obviously enjoy the lighting part of it and I'm glad to share it with you. And if you wanna know what it's doing, just switch modes. So I think that this needs to be out a little bit to help with that. Cool. What's causing this? Ah, so now I need to cut this down. I just want it to kiss. Yeah, there we go. That's it. All right. I think that once we get the blue in here, we're ready to rock. Oh, that is, that is, that is it. That's the coup de gras. The blue de gras. Yeah, I did say that. All right, starting the sequence. And now we're going to watch it go into... So this one, we're going to be, even, we're at higher magnification, so we're going to be even more careful to make sure that we wait between adjustments. Because you see, everything I do is magnified. So it's the wobbly coin. So we take a picture, move it in a little, wait for the jiggles to stop. And this is going to take about 100 pictures. This is fast forwarding. This takes a while. You just be careful, like we showed you on the last one, when you're stacking to make a small adjustment, wait for it to stop vibrating, and then take the picture, hopefully with something that doesn't I'm add vibration to your camera. This time and do a little bit of light editing before. Um, landscape, portrait, vivid. I think vivid's too crunchy, so I'm going to go landscape. And I'm going to a little dehaze, right? A little like dehaze. Bring those highlights down, whites up. Actually, I'm gonna go the other way. I'm gonna go highlights up, whites down. Yeah, that's better. And then I'm gonna bring my shadows up. And I'm gonna bring my blacks down. Now oh, there's nothing to do in the blacks then. Okay. And then. I'm going to sing again this, this is cooking to taste the the so uh-huh uh-huh sync settings choose all and go back to this guy and sync it backwards too great so now we have all these guys and we need to click export and we go helicon and then we go export and now it's going to take a long time to export these 75 photos so i said it was going to be about 90 um but it ended up being 75 and we'll wait for this to finish so this is using the tiff method you can also use the dng method uh, which takes even longer however you keep a, a raw image at the end of it, now which is something I experimented with after that. We've already done this. 
Um, we're going to render all this. And this obviously takes a while to do. Uh, and it's uh, this is very, very much fast forwarded, this process. Um, but it's, it's fun to watch the image mappings happen. And you can actually see where how meticulous you were with the focus building uh, during this process. And you can go in there and also go into the retouching and pick another layer that doesn't have some of the artifacts that might get picked up by the rendering process and clean them off the edges before sending it back in uh, over to Lightroom. And this is what I'm doing right now is I'm saving out all of those TIFFs to go back into Lightroom and we're gonna round trip it back into Lightroom. All right, let's just see what we've got here. Cool. So let's see. All right. This last setup, I extended the bellows a lot. I don't know why the, the video jumped around. Let's find out what happened here. Um, bear with me for a second while we find the right time code to get you in there. Uh, so uh, we went to extreme magnification on this last one. Um, and this one, I wanted to get, uh, I extended the bellows a lot. And the goal for this last shot was to, to get the two pesos the in the center. And yes, we're in fast forward mode right now. I did not work this fast. Uh, so everything had a moment to still out. And you'll notice that um, I had a very, very stable platform. We have these guys, and we're going to um, hit export. And we're gonna say Helicon Focus, and export. And now we're going to go through the, the processing once again for this. And you're going to you're going to see much of the same thing that we saw before. So I'm going to jump through it again. Uh, and nothing's a surprise here except there's a lot more pictures. And once you have increased your magnification, you have to take uh, into account your your act your aperture and making sure that you have enough fine steps when you shoot each photograph to get What's that thin, on? thin, thin slice of focus every time. Uh, if you miss one, you're going to have a stripe of softness. So uh, that was my goal doing that. And I think it was a, a real blast uh, doing this process and working through this for you guys. Um, so, I mean, this, this, this is really the end of this process, um, the, the end of the the part i'm sorry the end of the part that i, I recorded for you guys and, uh, uh, and i hope that you enjoyed uh watching this part so i'm back i hope that that uh helped you guys i saw that there was a pretty active q a going on um and the first one that we have uh is from roberto um how is the the focus breading interact with the final image roberto I, I i would um can you help me understand a little bit more uh the word breading is confusing me a little bit do you mean breathing um I'd, I'd like to i'd like to know and i'd like to help you out with that um so so that's that one um so all right uh let's hear your questions and while we're doing that I'm going to uh, just 
let you guys know that if you have specific gear questions, you're definitely welcome to ask them now. This is kind of more about technique, but we can answer gear questions. But we're going to have, um, we're going to have uh, another webinar coming up on Thursday, April fifteenth, with Martin, focusing on building your ideal macro bellows configuration. So, if you have uh, an interest in bellows, if you want to know what accessories you might need to build out a good bellows, um, whether it's the auto bellows or one of the other bellows systems, this is the right one to sign up for. And the link is uh, down there at the top of the chat, um, and it just popped out from the side there. Uh, please click that link and sign up for it if you'd like to know more about building your ideal uh, bell macro bellows configuration. It's going to be fun. Martin's explanations and showing all of the different tools in the system that you can put together are always amazing, amazing and thorough. So um, here we go. So let's see. Uh, Roberto says, OK, so uh, let, let me uh, let me see if I can answer Roberto's question about the focus breathing. Um, so I have. Uh, when you change the focus with the helicoid, there is a process called breathing. And that term, that term pretty much comes from uh, when you're doing filmmaking and you have a cine lens sort of like this that I have on here. I have this, uh, this Irix 11 millimeter cine lens. When you have that, you'll notice when you focus it, it breathes in and out a little bit like that. That's the breathing. It just expands and contracts. Uh, and you can see that in macro too. It's depending on how your lens is built. Uh, the optics may move in relation to the focus to the, the image sensor. And if you're moving the optics, then generally it's going to change the manuf the magnification. Uh, there are some lenses in particular that maintain a magnification when you focus them. But what we typically do in macro is we focus the lens and leave the lens where it is. Um, there are techniques, at least with the, the tools that we're, we're using, which is manual uh, macro focusing, the tools that we have here today. There are electronic repeatable ones that we have, like the Castell Micro. But this, I choose a magnification on my lens because it might be optimal for that lens. I know the one-to-one -one on my Lauer 100 millimeter is just fantastic at f8. I've done a lot of testing. I love it there, so I set it there. And then I use the bellows to increase the magnification up or down from there. If it's not enough, I'll go to the two-to-one or one and a half to one on my lens and then change the magnification on the bellows. Those relationships happen. And some of these you just need to work out with the gear that you have. So the breathing is a reason that you wouldn't want to use helicoid focusing, turning the lens barrel, because it, it might change your magnification uh, while you're doing it. So if you see that breathing, it may affect the quality of your focus stacking and helicon focus. My suggestion is if that's the only option you have right now, try it and stack it and see if it comes out adversely. Um, but we know from experience that the, the most reliable way to focus stack is to um, use a focusing rail. And that's what I've been doing. Uh, in fact, I have, um, I have my focus rail on right now. Uh, and I could show you guys that. That's, uh, I'll just unplug the HDMI from here. I have my Castell Q on here. Castell Q. Oh, you guys can barely see that. There we go. So I have the Castell Q, and I put the Castell Fine on it so that I can uh, very, very finely adjust that. So that's that's what I'm saying is it's best for you as a macro shooter to, I'm going to say in air quotes, to focus stack by moving your camera and not changing the focus on your lens and not changing the bellows. You establish the magnification and the focus like that ahead of time, and I'm saying focus on the lens barrel, and then you change the relationship of your camera to that uh, object that you're shooting by moving this lens barrel back and forth like that. So this is what we do in macro. All right, going back and looking at the, the chat and stuff. Uh-huh. Let's see what we have. 
Matt Bourgeois, good to see you, buddy. Uh, okay, Dennis asked me what the fiber optic light setup that you saw. Um, it's something I've been I've been playing with. Uh, it's it's not necessarily my my favorite thing. Uh, as personally, it's called Adaptalux. Um, they're a, a small company out of Britain, and they just have arms that you can put in. Um, and for certain situations, uh, I'm experimenting with it, and I'm trying to see if it's something that I'd like to use long term. Uh, so. It always it always gets the questions because it doesn't look like anything else out there. All right, let's check in on the Q and A here. New. Um, we've got a good a lot of yeses, a lot of yeses. Martin, thank you so much for answering questions uh, in the chat. We really appreciate that. Your knowledge is deep and wide. So let's see if there's anything else. Um, I think I want to read through a couple of these. Uh, do you provide a bellows for the Sony A7R4 and the Sony 90 millimeter macro lens? Martin's reply said, yes, we do. It's called the BAL-NEX, and there's a link there in the chat. Um, so that was a good one. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? So uh, Ruben followed up and said, uh, how much advantage does the Bell nex for Sony provide? And Martin replied, It'll let you increase the maximum magnification beyond one to one, except two to two and a half to one with the bellows in your 90 millimeter lens. Um, there were some questions about Helicon Remote out there. It only works with um, lenses that the camera manufacturer provides. So uh, if you use a third party lens, like I'm using a Lauer, which is a completely manual lens, uh, that, that won't work. But I guess Helicon Remote could work with my. Nikon uh, 24 to 70 f2.8 s lens because this is a completely electronic lens so helicon remote could work with that but that's something that I personally haven't worked with yet I guess Martin has uh-huh so here we go all right so that covers all of the Q&A that I saw um, and I'd like to see what else we have here so what else do we have to tell you guys about? I really want to reiterate that we'd love, love, love for you guys to take a picture. We want to give $500 in NovaFlex gear to somebody. Please enter our photo contest. The link is down there. Um, and I'm going to also post it in the chat because I'm very interested in seeing what you guys do. I really, really want to see what you got. Take a picture of a coin and uh enter today we really want to see what you do so here we go there's some other stuff coming up um yeah so and the last thing i just wanted to reiterate again is this is that we really want you guys to also uh come join us for martin's presentation on the 15th of april uh, which here in the states wouldn't you rather be doing anything else but taxes on tax day come join us and learn more about configuring the best bellows uh, configuration. So that is it. To all of you who attended, I got to say thank you. Um, this was really fun to produce. It was great to, to put it together for you. I'd like your feedback. Um, if you have anything you want to say, you'll get emails from us. You can hit reply to those. Let me know what you liked. Let me know what you want us to do better or even more of. We're very interested in that because uh, we do it for you. Uh, so without any further guessing, talking, all that good stuff, I guess I'm going to like go make myself a coffee now and say thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we hope you guys have a good day. Um, yeah. And uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to hit stop the recording now and say thank you.